we are very, very pleased to have John Feinberg with us today um, to tell us about graph theoretic models of behavioral phenomenon. So um, John Feinberg is the Tisch University professor in the departments of computer science and information science at Cornell University. His research focuses on the interaction of algorithms and networks and the roles they play in large scale social and information systems. He's the author of the books, Algorithm Design with Eva Tardos and Networks, Crowds and Markets with David Easley. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering and is the recipient of research fellowships from the MacArthur, Packard, Simons and Sloan Foundations as well as awards including the Harvey Prize, the Nevelina Prize, and the ACM Prize in Computing. And we are very excited to have him with us today uh, to tell us about some of his graph modeling. Excellent. So thank you very much, John. Well, thanks very much. And uh, let me start just by making sure everybody can, can hear me. And uh, uh, um, <clears throat> well, thanks for the invitation to uh, Take, take part in this. I think this is a, a great way to bring together a community of uh, geographically distributed people. Uh, this is a, a kind of thing that we've also tried with some of the groups that we're doing uh, here at Cornell on some other topics. And uh, you know, I'm very glad to take, take part in this one. So I'm a, a, um, I should also mention as I go th through, through these slides, you know, I would certainly be happy to take, take a questions as they come up and if there's some topic that we want to spend more more time on then certainly go with that so i i should start off by saying i'm a, i'm, I'm a, a computer scientist and um one thing that i think is always uh you know potentially you know struck striking for people in mathematics as they look at computer science is the the extent to which discrete mathematical models are really at the core of a lot of how we think about problems and a lot of the training you know, of computer scientists really across all sub sub disciplines really em emphasizes the sort of you know the universality of structures like graphs and networks as uh tools for modeling and so what i want to talk about here was a recent experience i had with uh two two uh, phd students uh uh a current phd student manish raghavan and sagal or or ran a uh, recent phd graduate of mine um in which we were looking at some issues in the behavioral sciences and really found that graph theoretic models formed a, a very nice abstraction of what was going on and, and gave us uh, some very interesting things to think about that unified a number of the principles that, that, we, that, we, that, we, that we had found in the behavioral science literature. The general starting point here for this and for a lot of work that I uh, have been interested in is to, to really think about building models of the online world uh, and to really approach the online world as a, a phenomenon to be studied and to be reasoned about. And this is really um, con con contained in a number of colorful quotes from the, the 1990s as we saw this really massive public em embrace of the World Wide Web and the, and the internet. So for example, Jim Gray in his Turing War address now 20 years ago this spring, uh, talked about how the emergence of cyberspace and the World Wide Web was like the discovery of, of a new continent, that there was really something new here. And rather than think of this as a, a technological system that we had built, um, you know, where arguably the value of studying it naturalistically might be more limited, in some sense it felt like the web and the internet was evolving un under its own power, according to its own principles. And so, although at some level we were attempting to design and engineer it as computer scientists, in another respect, it was really growing on its own and it was really following fundamental social and behavioral principles that tend to be robust when you bring large collections of people together and they begin into, into interacting, they begin communicating with each other, they begin creating things. Um, and there are a lot of stories one could tell here about the ways in which different mathematical models, I think, help provide an insight into some of what was going on, both in the early days of the World Wide Web and also out to, to the present. I want to pick one of those stories here uh, and del delve into it in some detail. And the, the particular story I want to focus on begins with the idea of trying to model collective work on the internet. So there are a lot of things that people do when 
they go online. They go online and take part in social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. They communicate with their friends. They express opinions. They upload things that they've created. But one thing that people also do is they get together to get work done. And so Wikipedia is certainly one of the main examples of this where large numbers of people around the world come together and, and there really is a, a whole distributed organizational high, high hierarchy uh, that takes place there. And people in these systems, Stack Overflow and, and the whole Stack Exchange collection of websites is another example, including Math Overflow, Stack Overflow, and a number of other places, where, again, people get together and they use their expertise to create things. Some of the characteristics of these kinds of systems is that people tend to have these very long uh, engagements with them, right? People can have a, a very long career as a Wikipedia editor, as a question answerer on Stack Overflow. They set goals for themselves, they set milestones for themselves, they work towards them. On Wikipedia, for example, there are, you know, there are reputational measures, there's a promotion process, you can get promoted to become an admin of the, the, the system once you've reached the vicinity of maybe 10,000 at its lifetime. And so, People do operate, you know, much as they do in in the in the in the offline world, where we set goals and then we work work toward them. Um, we looked both of the theoretical aspects of this, which is what I'll be talking about here. We also looked at some of the data from these systems because these systems are really, from a, a data analysis point of view, fascinating environment. Wikipedia, for example, is by definition completely public, and they really have this commitment to transparency so that you, you don't just see the current versions of articles, you see all of the old versions of articles, you see all the edits that people made, you see all their actions on, on the system. The whole thing is organized as a wiki that you can roll, 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 roll back in time. Stack Overflow, um, similarly as possible to look at a lot of this data. And we, we began to look, just from a, a data-driven point of view, at the kinds of trajectories that people followed over the course of their careers on these systems. We imagine we were in some kind of a, a state space where you can either produce edits, you can answer people's questions, you can communicate. The amount of each of these that you do, you could almost imagine as like a dimension in the space and you could follow sort of the flow lines that people traversed as they built up edits, built up communication acts and so forth. And what we found was that there were certain parts in that state space that people seemed to sort of be steering toward, right? That these trajectories would almost sort of bend around them as though they were sort of approaching a gravitating body. And often when we'd go look at what was going on there, we would find that when people's trajectories through the system, their careers didn't follow the track that we expected, it was usually because somewhere in the design of the system, people had planted an incentive measure, an incentive mechanism right there. So for example, um, we, we looked on Stack Overflow and we found that there are these things that they award called badges. Uh, and if you do a certain number of kinds of activities, you receive a badge, which incurs some reputational benefits, it unlocks certain ab abilities for you on the site. You know, so for example, there's this badge called Civic Duty over here on, on the left. And we plotted the following graph, um, which I'm, I have here on the left. We, we said, let's look on Stack Overflow and let's look at the questions people ask, the answers they give, the votes they make on questions, the votes they make on answers. Because Stack Overflow, if you've used it or if you use Math Overflow, depends on the idea of upvoting content. And so it's very important to them that people vote. And so how do you reward voting? Well, you can create a badge like this Civic Duty badge that says, if you vote 300 times, you will receive this badge that says you're an active voter in the, you know, in the system. And what we discovered is that as people began approaching the badge, so you get 280 votes, you get 285 votes, 290, you can feel the badge approaching, you actually start to accelerate in your behavior that's gonna enable the badge. You accelerate in your voting. So for example, in this plot, on the x-axis, we take everybody who received this badge and we say for each one of them, time zero right here is the day that they won the badge. And on the y-axis is the number of actions of each of these four types, asking, answering, voting on questions, voting on answers, uh, that they engaged in. And you, you, you can see that you can, you can feel the approach of the badge. As people begin to approach here, um, the, the rate of voting on questions and answers increases sharply toward day zero, the day on which they win the badge, while the other activities of doing on the site seem un unaffected. It's not that there's a 
absolute increase in activity. There's an activity, there's a kind of steering toward the badge uh, as you go. And so this and other experiences with this kind of data cause us to begin asking these questions. How does the placement of incentives and milestones in systems where people have very long lifespans and where people have dependencies among their actions, how does that change the behavior that people engage in? And as, as we thought about this question, we realize, of course, it's not a question that only exists in the online world. It's, in fact, a question that, you know, for most of our experiences, mainly exists in, in the offline world, right? So we, you know, we take courses so that we can graduate from high school or from college. We seek out advanced degrees like PhDs. We try to get a job. We do research so that we can you know, eventually writing it up as a paper that we submit and then that we get reviews and we revise it and it gets accepted and then we present it. We, we have these long chains of actions that we engage in knowing that there's some kind of a goal that we've set for ourselves at the end of it. Um, and so when, when we think about this, there's a large body of work in the mathematical social sciences that has studied how people approach goals, um, both why we're able to effectively make plans to reach them, right? Because there's a lot of reasoning that has to take place in that. And it's an impressive thing that humans are able to, you know, maintain the focus over sometimes multiple years to actually achieve goals, but also the ways in which we can sometimes fail to achieve our goals, the way in which we set goals for ourselves and don't actually make it all the way to the end. Uh, a behavior that at first may seem irrational, but it too can be modeled mathematically. So in trying to understand the online world, we actually began looking at some of this mathematical social science literature in the offline world. And we discovered that there were a lot of interesting, distinct models there, and that actually a graph theoretic view of what was going on could help unify some of what had been taking place in that literature. And so that's, that's what I want to talk about, how uh, the use of graph theory here actually, we found quite clarifying in our thinking about how the, how the evolution of models had been taking place in this area. So the notion of making plans for the future, um, as I said, a very common activity. Um, here, for example, is a uh, screenshot from a website of the uh, Tacoma Public School System. This is only the very top of the web page. these things here, um, showing what, it, what is it you need to do in order to graduate from high school. You know, you have to earn a certain number of credits, allocate across a certain number of different areas. Certain courses have prerequisites, so I need to take this one before that one. There are dependencies. It's a relatively complicated structure that you're navigating on your way toward this goal, which is to achieve high school diploma. And, and so you can imagine that, you know, if we wanted to model this abstractly, I have an agent that's traversing this space of alternatives. Um, and they have set this goal for themselves. Um, and they're presumably evaluating costs and benefits. There's some amount of effort you need to put in to do all of this work. It's taking away from other things you might be doing. On the other hand, there's this large benefit at the end that, that, that they're just trying for. And so when we ask about this, we ask, okay, why is it that people might fail to achieve their plans? Well, one is that you may not completely know the costs and benefits, and they may actually change over time. It could be that two years into high school, um, someone in your family loses their job, you have to work part-time, that somehow cuts into the time you had planned to allocate for studying or working on your classes, the whole calculation changes, right? So, so something outside your control has, has changed, and that's actually why uh, just below this on the Tacoma Public High School website, they actually draw the graduation requirements in a different view as a treasure map filled with buried treasure, but also quicksand and unexpected forks in the road. And, you know, that this somehow conveys how difficult this can actually be. But the other thing that can go wrong is, is sort of more mysterious, but also familiar to any of us who have engaged in uh, planning and goal setting, which is what you might call time inconsistency. Nothing in particular changes, yet you find that you're not actually following through on the, on the goal that you set for yourself. Um, a sort of canonical example of this that, that behavioral scientists like coming back to is uh, gym membership, right? So we sort of all have, you know, th this has either happened to us, happened to someone we know, or we're certainly familiar with the concept that uh, a common thing that happens is you wake up one morning and you decide, you know, I have a great idea. Uh, I'm going to join a gym. Uh, and this is going to be great because I have this hour, you know, kind of 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. before I have to, to go to work. I'll just get up an hour earlier. 
I'll go, I'll exercise, I'll feel better, I'll be healthier, I'll have more energy during the day. There are just so many benefits. And so this screenshot is from Great Britain. You pay your 19 pounds 95 uh, and you join the gym. And then a funny thing happens. It's not that you, you know, sprain your ankle or get injured or otherwise can't go. It's actually just more that when the 6.30 a.m. comes around and the time comes to get up, you just don't really feel like doing it. I mean, it's early, you could sleep for an extra hour. And so you don't go to the gym and the gym membership goes, goes to waste. Uh, now this is an interesting situation. It's something we all, we all can recognize, but what it, right, but it, it reflects again this, this concept of time inconsistency because any model, you know, I, I won't try to state this completely formally, but it, it feels reasonable that any model of an agent, you know, who's choosing an optimal sequence giving costs and benefits, as we wrote up here, it would be hard to model what has just happened with the gym membership using such a model. Why is that? Because it, it's fine not to join the gym. That's fine. It's also fine to join the gym and get up an hour earlier and go exercise. But it's hard to imagine a model of optimal behavior in which you pay the 20 pounds and then you don't do anything. You should either not have paid the money and not gone to the gym or you should have paid the money and followed through. But what you did feels like it cannot be the optimal solution to any reasonable optimization. So what to do, right? We, and I, th I think in the early days of the behavioral sciences looking at these issues, it, a lot of it consists of a sort of cataloging of these anomalies and you know, a sort of conceptual throwing up of one's hands saying people are just irrational, what can we do? But there was a, a second wave that began where people said, let's try to build simple models of agent behavior that we can actually reason about, that we can sort of play with analytically in which agents actually do this, in which agents actually behave in time consistent ways. And some of the earliest versions of this uh, were sort of interesting one-off mathematical stories that people told about either their own behavior or, or other behavior. Um, a good example of this was actually a, a paper by the Nobel uh, laureate in economics, George Akerlof at Berkeley, um, which he, in which he built a model around a story from his uh, sabbatical that he spent in, the, in India. So he was in India. And the end of his sabbatical was approaching. It was n days away. He was going to fly back to Berkeley, and he had this large cardboard box of uh, his things that he wanted to ship back to Berkeley. And the day came when, if he ships it today, then uh, it will arrive so that it's there right when he gets back, and he'll have access to it, which he wanted. Um, okay. However, shipping it, of course, uh, is a pain because you know it's this large box. He has to go to the post office, which is some distance away. He has to wait in line. He has to fill out a lot of forms. Eventually, it's going to take half the day. Um, and so you can sort of abstractly think, George Akerlof is this agent. He has a goal. The goal is to ship a package sometime in the next 10 days. There's this one-time effort cost C to ship it, which is quite large. But if you don't ship it now, and in fact, each day you don't ship it, you get this loss of use cost X, which is small. Okay, So you incur a small cost every day you don't ship it because that's one more day than you'll be back home and you don't have access to it. So what to do? Well, if we were trying to plan optimally given costs and benefits, then uh, we have the following optimization problem. Okay, so here's our optimization problem. Um, if you ship it on day T, well, you pay the cost C, because the one-time cost happens no matter what you do, you have to go to the post office. Uh, and if you ship it on day T, you lose T days of access to it when you get back. So you also pay T times X. So you're faced with the following optimization problem. And this is one of the easier optimization problems you'll encounter today. You would like to minimize C plus TX over choices of T from one to N. Okay, uh, so for those of you trying this out at home, uh, this is minimized when T equals one because I simply wanna make this term as small as possible. It's the only one I have control over. It is telling us something that is in fact clear from the very outset of the story. Ship it today. You're gonna to have to pay the cost of C no matter what you do. You might as well do it today, and then you'll have the box right when you get there. But George Akerlof in the story, as he recounts it, did not do this. He did something that we might all recognize uh, from our own behavior. He procrastinated. Um, so what does procrastination look like here? Each day, he didn't do it. Every day that came along, it felt like today is just not a good day to do it. Um, but tomorrow will be good. And each day, in fact, he had, a, he had actually a relatively specific plan. He didn't just plan, I'll do it sometime. He had a very specific plan. He would do it tomorrow. Um, 
But the effect, of course, is that you end up waiting until the last day when it must be shipped. Um, because at that point, you have a totally different calculation on your hands. You either abandon the box, which you're not going to do, or you just ship it. And so you end up with a significantly higher cumulative cost. You actually lose access to it for the end days that it's transmitting. OK, so again, something that we can all sort of recognize from our behavior. But George Yakovlev did something that you know, not all of us would necessarily have done. He decided he'd build a model of his own behavior. And for that, he went back to some earlier work in the behavioral sciences from the 50s and 60s um, that said, let's take an agent engaging in these kinds of cost-benefit calculations, but let's add one more ingredient to it, which is that uh, the following point. Costs incurred today are more salient than costs occurred any other day. Okay? So a cost that you have to incur today is raised by some factor B greater than one. And all costs in the future look the same. Okay? Now, if I think about a model like that, I should stress this is different from uh, a kind of model that's very popular in, in mathematical economics, which is time discounting. Right? So a, a common activity is I say uh, a cost incurred t steps into the future, there's some multiplier delta less than one. And if I incur a cost t steps in the future, I'll multiply by delta to the t power. Okay? That's a relatively time consistent thing to do because it basically says the value of everything is shrinking by a factor of delta as it recedes into the future. But if everything is shrinking by a factor of delta, then in some sense your calculations are consistent. The next step will look like this step, just shrunk it. And there are, there, and there, and there are lots of reasons why you might want to shrink the future by a factor of delta every step. For example, money, you know, due to inflation, money is less valuable. Or the whole thing, you know, the whole scenario might come to an end with probability. Um, one minus delta, so the chance that you even have to worry about this t steps in the future is delta to the t. There are a lot of reasons you might do this. This is different. This says the present is different from every other time period. Every, every other time period looks the same, but the present is different. Um, and so for that reason, uh, behavioral economists call this present bias. You're biased toward the present. Let's picture what a present biased agent does in George Akerlof's situation. They engage in the following reason. They say, if I send the package today, I have to incur this cost of C right now. And that looks like B times C. And again, C is huge. B is bigger than one. But if I send it tomorrow, I'm in the second bullet here. That says, uh, maybe if I'm really smart, I'll feel the loss of use cost you know, right now, although we could debate whether that happens. But that's only B times X, and X is tiny. And then this is one times C. So now I'm asking, which would I rather pay? b times c or one times c plus this low order term b times x. And so tomorrow is actually preferable to today as long as this simple inequality holds. And this simple inequality should hold if b is bounded away from one, c is very big, x is very small. Um, and in fact, it's just like his reasoning suggested. Tomorrow is the optimum. Waiting two days from now, that doesn't help at all. That's just an extra term of x. But wait until tomorrow for this kind of agent helps. Okay. So my, my goal here is the, 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 the research on this sort of forks in two directions. One is to ask, why do we have this factor of B? You know, why is this factor of B reasonable? What might be the kind of evolutionary mechanism for people to have developed a factor of B where the present seems salient? And there's a bunch of work there, which is, which is sort of an interesting thing about it. Um, here, I want to talk about a second family of models that basically axiomatizes the factor of B. It says, let's just take the factor of B as a given. It's the one assumption we're going to make. And then let's see how far we can get with that one assumption. How many other behaviors can we derive as we derive procrastination here if we make this single assumption of a factor of B that makes the present more salient? So this grew into a large body of literature in, in behavioral e e economics. It, um, goes under a number of names, uh, including this term quasi-hyperbolic discounting uh, to be contrasted with traditional discounting. Um, and it's, it's sort of not crucial for our purposes uh, exactly what the general framework is, because we're going to be working in this sort of special case of it. But, you know, it's in fact been combined with traditional discounting to say that uh, a cost or reward of C that's realized T units in the future has some present value that's a single multiplier beta, that's like the analog of our B, times this exponential discounting delta the t times the cost c. And we're working in the special case where there is no geometric discounting. So all future steps look the same. 
B is the single term that happens right at the beginning that distinguishes the present from all future steps. And finally, and this is important actually, that the agent is naive about their bias. The agent always optimistically believes that somehow they're not going to experience this bias in the future, and they plan according to that. At the end, I'll talk about what's called sophistication, where in place of naivete, we imagine an agent who does suffer from the bias, but at least can reason about that in their future. Okay, so what, what people in behavioral economics discovered is that um, from this set of assumptions, you can model things like procrastination, as we just saw in the George Ackerlock story. You can model other things like task abandonment, which basically think of it as long tasks that you undertake and then stop halfway through. So for example, in a burst of enthusiasm, you begin writing a six chapter monograph on your research area um, and things are going great through the first two chapters. And then for no particular reason, uh, you stop. And those two chapters sit there on your laptop. Uh, you don't really publish them. You don't finish the book. And again, this cannot be optimal because you either, it's fine not to write a monograph, but you should have either not done it or you should have finished it, but writing two chapters that never see the light of day can't be the right thing to do, it feels. Um, and finally, this notion of the benefits of choice reduction, that for a biased agent who has behavioral bias, sometimes it can actually improve their performance if you reduce the set of options that are available to them. You reduce their choices. For an agent that's optimally balancing costs and benefits, reducing their set of choices somehow can't help because if you had a choice and they don't want to use it, they just don't use it. But for a biased agent, as we'll see, that can happen. Okay, but what interested uh, Manish and Segal and me as we looked at this literature in our effort to try to understand models of long range planning was that each of these things, procrastination, task abandonment, choice reduction, each involved its own intricate story, sort of like, like we saw with the George Akerlof story here, but you know, successively, progressively more complicated stories where you had to get everything right. And we became interested in the question of, could I somehow tell all these stories at once in a sort of common language, a common framework, so that we didn't have to kind of handcraft each one. And we discovered that graphs were actually a beautiful language for doing exactly that, for telling all of these stories all at once. And in fact, therefore being able to do things that you can't do in, in these sort of non-graph theory frameworks, such as putting a universal quantifier across all stories and asking, you know, what are the extreme points of that? Okay, for example, once we had a graph theoretic framework, we could ask things like cost ratio. So in computer science, we're fond of asking the following, kind, following genre of question, that I have an agent who is computationally limited in some way, and they're gonna solve a problem. And we're gonna compare their performance to an agent that's computationally unbounded and can solve the problem in some sense perfectly. So uh, a well-known example of this is the idea of polynomial time approximation algorithms. We take some problem that we believe cannot be solved in polynomial time, like the traveling salesman problem, and we ask, what is the best solution uh, obtainable by an agent that's computationally unbounded, that can do as much computation as it wants? And we say, and how much worse does an agent do if it's constrained to run in polynomial time? We do this with online algorithms. What is the cost of not knowing the future? We do this with game theoretic algorithms. What is the cost of not being able to coordinate? And here, we're trying to do this with present bias. What is the cost incurred by an agent that experiences this factor of B, this present bias? Um, how much worse are they than an optimal agent that's able to operate without the bias? So we sort of want to ask this question, you know, across all stories in which present bias has an effect, what's the worst cost ratio? But it's sort of not clear what this actually means, right? the max over all stories S of the cost ratio, right? So there's the high school graduation story, the gym membership story, the package shipping story. I don't really know how to quantify over stories. But if I had some combinatorial structure that encoded the stories, I would know how to quantify over that. So how do I find a combinatorial structure that lets me express all of these things? Okay, so that's where the graph theoretic framework comes into play, okay? And so here we are at this sort of boundary between this past work that sort of worked things out one at a time uh, piecemeal and this graph theoretic language that we're trying to propose. So in the graph theoretic language, the idea is to say the agent is operating in some space of abstract states, right? So this is maybe high school graduation. They start here at node S uh, over on the left and they enter high school there. Um, and they're trying to get to a goal state like node T uh, where they have graduated from high school. Okay. And there are various paths they can follow with dependencies. You know, you can take the 
you know, the technical sequence, the less technical sequence, there's a kind of sub choice here, we can kind of go this way or that way. Um, and so you have, you have choices, and there are costs associated with these choices, but you would like to reach the target node T. Okay? So I like to traverse, and so this, this is a very common in computer science formalism, planning as traversal of a directed graph with costs on the edges. Okay. And you would like to find, say, the, the cheapest path from S to T. Now, if I look at this, the cheapest path from S to T, uh, this is a problem that you know, we solve a lot, you know, a lot in computer science. We do it, for example, when Google Maps gives us driving directions weighted by you know, traffic times. Um, the shortest path would be to take this arc, paying 16, then pay two here, and then pay this, this last two here. And that would be uh, length of 20. And that is the cheapest path to get from S to T. Of course, it's all predicated on the idea that these numbers are modeling something that we're interested in modeling, but let, let's think about it abstractly. And right? that would be better than, for example, the straight through path, which is A plus A plus okay. What struck us was that this was a beautiful place to simply slide this factor of B greater than one into something we understand, namely shortest paths on the graph. So the idea is that from a given node, the present costs are more salient. So the immediately outgoing edges of your of your current node have cost multiplied by a factor of b greater than one. Let's imagine, for example, that b is equal to two. So that says the agent sitting at s looks out and says, okay, the upper path now has a cost of 16 times two, plus two plus two is 36, okay? Whereas going straight through looks like eight times two uh, plus eight plus eight is only 32. And going this lower route is eight times two plus two plus 16 is 34. So to the agent, they think that the straight through path is actually the cheapest path. Now I should stress that the, the costs written in black have a meaning in the outside world. This is what you will actually incur to actually achieve your goal. And so us looking outside from the outside as maybe designers of the system trying to help the agent be effective, we would like the agent to minimize their costs written in black. The agent perceives the cost in red, however, and that torques their behavior. So they say, well, I'm gonna go straight across because that's, to me, the cheapest looking path. And obviously it's because they're trying to avoid paying this enormous 16 right in front. But they get to here and things look different. Because now that they're standing at node C, this looks like eight times two plus eight is 24, and this looks like two times two plus 16 is only 20. So they actually end up going through E, they get to T, and they end up paying this eight plus two plus 16, 26. So two things happen in this example, both of which are sort of familiar from the discussion so far. One is the agent did something suboptimal because of their bias. Second, they didn't even do what they initially planned to do. They started out this way thinking they'd go straight across, but they ended up taking this lower route. Okay, so they were suboptimal and they were timing consistent. And, and the other point is that it was sort of effortless to discover all this in a model based on shortest paths in a graph. Uh, because you simply write down the cost, you analyze what happens, we didn't need to sort of write down an enormous list of bullet points describing the entire scenario as I had to previously. Um, now, we should check, can we really model real things with this? Uh, and we discovered that actually, we sort of know that directed graphs are very expressive for modeling traversals of state spaces. So for example, here's George Akerlof's story written as a graph. George Akerlof starts at day S here where he's in possession of the package and nothing has happened yet, he's trying to get to, to node T here in the middle, which is the, uh, the goal state where the package has been mailed. And node VI simply means he has reached day I without sending the package. Right? And so this is, this is that story. From node S, you're tantalizingly close to node T. You would just have to traverse this one thing, this one node from S to T, and you would have made it right along here. Um, but, you have another option, which is that you could uh, incur only b times x, go this way, and end up here. And you're now faced with basically an equivalent version of the problem, although inductively you're one step closer to this end of the, the, the fan structure. Right? And so an agent who thinks of this as costing b times c is going to actually prefer to pay b times x plus c. And this is exactly the George Akerlof story. The agent who thinks of the present edge cost as multiplied by factor b uh, with the right parameters will actually go all the way around the outside and a v5 they have no choice but to pay the term c that they would have had to pay anyway. Okay, so very easily we, we, can, we can write down that entire story. It's simply the traversal of this fan-shaped graph. 
Um, we can add other things to the, the model. So for example, the idea of task abandonment um, is simply a variation where I'm gonna add one more thing to the model. So far, I've told you about a story like in George Akerlof's case here, where you must get to T, just because we've decided you're not going to abandon this box. You're going to eventually make it to the post office. But maybe, and even implicitly in that story, really what's happening is there's a reward at the target that you claim if you get to T. If I can get to T, I claim this reward in this case of 11. And I have to decide, is it worth it to me to pay these costs to get there? Now, in the current situation, uh, in this example, either path incurs a cost of eight to claim a reward of 11. Like, again, in real units, these are the units the agent will actually incur. So it is certainly in the agent's interest to make it to T and, pay, and claim this reward. They will achieve a net reward of 11 minus eight, of namely three. How do they think about it? Well, they say, well, if I go this way, I pay, again, B is two, B is two in all my examples. I pay two times two plus six, that's 10 to get a reward of 11. If I go this way, I pay two times three plus five, I pay 11 to get 11. Imagine actually this is like 11 plus epsilon on the reward, so when I'm indifferent, I still do it. But this path is certainly better looking because I only, in, I perceive a cost of 10. The problem is I get to the halfway point, I get to node A, now I'm looking at six times two is 12, it's not worth the reward of 11. And so I actually stop here. I abandon my progress. And this, this two that I paid is just gone, right? I paid this cost of two and it was useless to me because I've given up at no day. Right? And so th this is the, I have to write this two part, this two part treatise. I get through the first part and when I get to have to do the second part, I just don't do it. And so this effort goes to waste. But notice that we can also effortlessly model the benefits of choice reduction here. Suppose I helpfully showed up and I simply deleted this node. I said, sorry, this is not actually an option for you. Well, now the agent looks and says, this is two times three plus five, that's 11. And if this is 11 plus epsilon, it's worth it to me. And so the agent follows the lower path, makes it all the way, because after all, when they get here, it looks like two times five is 10. And so they actually, they benefit, they complete the task. And all we have to do is take away this option from them. An agent who is actually optimizing costs and benefits in a shortest path problem, you can't possibly help them by removing part of the graph. That only takes away options that might lower their cost. But for an agent that experiences behavioral bias, this can easily happen as it did here, okay? And so actually one interesting open computational question, and then I'll mention this again as, as, we, as we go on, is um, if I present you with a directed graph and I have a, a biased agent and we try it out and we see the agent cannot complete uh, the path to get to the reward, but they would benefit from doing so, can you find a set of nodes you could delete from the graph that would now make it possible for the biased agent to complete the test, right? Is there a subgraph that supports that? Uh, that turns out to look, appear to be a very interesting combinational problem, um, which is largely open as far as our understanding of it goes. Let me just show you one more example. And my point here is to sort of, again, play with the model a little bit more, but also just show you how we can even take very complicated stories, uh, stories that sort of, you know, we're at the limit of what people really are able to talk about with these behavioral models. And again, with very limit, very little effort, write them down and reason about them. So this is a story about completing or not completing a course that has a sequence of coursework. Um, to be able to do this example kind of in real time here, um, I'll portray it very succinctly as just, it's a three week short course that has two projects over the course of the semester, okay? Um, let's not worry about the graph yet, let's read the story and then we'll, decide that this graph does represent the story. So finishing the course comes with a reward. I've chosen these numbers carefully for my example. There's a reward of 16 from finishing the course. Now, every week you have to decide, do I just attend class, do I do one of the two projects, or do I do both projects in that week? Uh, and the effort cost, I'll, I'll incur one from just going to class, not doing a project that week. I'll pay a cost of four if I do one project that week. And I'll pay a cost of nine if I do both projects. Because after all, when we're thinking about outlay of effort, it's often, uh, sort of super additive like this in the sense that, you know, the second project you do is coming away from time that you can less and less afford to spare because you've already, you're already, you know, nearly maxed out on the first one. Okay, so we'll say that node VIJ means that I weeks of the course have gone by and the student has completed J projects. In other words, time is going from left to right, right? It goes here, it goes here. This is time passing. Uh, progress in the course goes down from top to bottom. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm here, a possible trajectory is that the first week I do one project, now I'm at V11. The second week I do the second project, I'm at V22. 
and then I can coast. I just make it to T, it's so easy, right? Okay, the whole thing looks very doable. After all, you know, I just do them in separate weeks. I pay eight for those two weeks. I pay one more for the final week. So I can finish this course with an effort cost of nine. I can reap the war of 16. It's great. How does the biased agent reason? Well, they say, you know, I could do that. But if I do that, I pay, what, two times four in the first week, that's eight. I pay one times four in the next week, and I pay one in the final week, that's 13, um, which would be worth it, I get 16. But I have a better plan. I don't do anything in the first week. I pay two times one. And then I'll do one each week, and I get four plus four, and I pay 10. And I still get the reward of 16. That all sounds good. We get to the next week, and the agent says, you know, actually, I, I have a new plan. I was going to do one each week, but that looks like two times four plus four is 12, which is still worth it. But I could do it more cheaply by not doing anything this week. I'll pay two times one, and then I'll get to this final thing, and then in a burst of activity, I'll do the last two projects. And, and as we know from down here, that costs nine. Sounds great. We get to the last week. Well, now it doesn't look so appealing because now we're looking at two times nine. I have to do it all at once. Two times nine is not worth 16. And so, in fact, what happens is, at this point, having done none of the work, and with one week to go in the course, you drop the class, because you just don't think it's worth it to complete all of that work in one final week, and you don't actually complete the class. Um, now, could we have done something to help the agent? Well, yeah, actually, suppose we simply deleted this node from the graph. Said so this node is off limits, you can't go. Then we would have discovered that the agent still reasons, I won't do anything the first week. But they get to here and they say, oh, well now I only have one choice. I only have one way to make it to T, which is to do the first project here, paying four times two, and the next one here, paying four and I pay 12. And so if I delete this node through choice reduction, the agent succeeds. Now, this is something we all actually, any of us who've taught a class, recognize that we actually ourselves put this giant X through parts of the state space whenever we teach a class. Because when we start out the class, or at least, we typically do this unless we're, you know, uh, I would say for the generic kind of class that, that one teaches, you, you have a set of assignments and you always have the option of simply releasing all the assignments at the beginning of the semester and saying, you're all adults, budget your time, pace yourselves, and at the end of the semester, I wanna see all the work done. And any of us who've tried this, you know, and I've tried versions of this, know this can become a complete train wreck because People with the best of intentions, they don't do it, they don't do it, other things come up, it just doesn't seem like the right time to do it. And suddenly, with a week to go, there's this emergency on the, you know, where uh, you know, there's just no way to finish all the work that you still have to do, and people end up not completing it. And so, what do you do? You can create, you, you create deadlines. You say, the first piece of work must be done by week two, and the next piece of work must be done by week four. And in doing that, you are exactly deleting parts of the state space. You're like, you're not allowed to go here. You're not allowed to reach week uh, K of the course, having done only J of the, of the assignment so far. And in that way, you're actually helping people who, like all human beings, experience behavioral biases to actually find a plan that's gonna allow them to finish the course. And again, the point is not so much that we were able to model this exact story, but how easily it is within this framework to model these kinds of stories. You draw the graph, you reason about the costs and benefits, you reason about what the agent is doing in their traversal. And, and a lot of it maps on the things that, 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 that we can recognize. Um, but it, I'll come back to this question. In addition to examples, we can also quantify over all possible stories written as graphs. And so we can ask extremal questions. We can ask, how large can certain things get? What is the worst case? Um, so for example, I'll just do, do, do this with one that we've looked at, uh, the cost ratio. So, in the George Akerlof story, the cost ratio got pretty big, but it didn't get nearly as big as it could have gotten. And so let me show you a slight variation of the George Akerlof story. You'll see it's the same graph. The only difference is that my costs are now C, C squared, C cubed, all the way up to C to the N here, where N is the number of nodes. Um, this is a story that's sort of where the cost ratio ends up being like B to the N. If I think of C as roughly equal to B in this story. And it's a story that's almost, almost too painful to tell, right? That the agent could have just gone straight to the goal here and paid C, but to them it was like B times C. And if B is a little bigger than C, you know, but not much bigger, then B times X plus C squared looks better to them. So they go here. But when they're here, they could pay what looks to them like B times C squared, they could pay C cubed. So they go here. 
And every single time they go, the cost blows up by a factor of close to B. And so by the end, they just pay this astronomically large cost, right? The thing just keeps getting worse and worse. You don't do it again. It's almost too painful to consider, so we'll move on. But this is how the uh, cost ratio can get very, very, very large, even though your bias is relatively mild at every step along the way. OK. So is this the worst? Is this how bad things can get? Or are there even worse ones? So it turns out this is really the worst. This factor of b to the n is about as bad as things can get. But that's, that's quite bad. So let's ask a structural question. When the cost ratio is exponential in the size of the graph, is some constant to the n, must there be some kind of a iterated procrastination story, this kind of thing, hiding in there? Right? What is an iterated procrastination story? Well, intuitively, it's some structure that looks like this. So when we're talking about graphs, we're talking about the idea of a structure that looks like this. What are we really talking about? Well, we can talk about this using a number of formalisms, subgraph containment, topological containment, but it turned out to be useful for us to talk about this in the language of graph minors. So a number of you have dealt with graph minors and things that you've worked on just to set definitions here. I'll say that a graph H is a minor of a graph G. If I can find connected, disjoint connected subsets of G, contract them into supernodes and produce a copy of H. So for example, if H were the complete graph on four vertices, I might find these four red sets. They're all connected, they're all disjoint. I can track them and I have a copy of the complete graph on four vertices. And in that way, H is a minor of G, right? K4 is a minor of G. Okay, so let's ask a graph minor version of this question about must every bad example for the cost ratio somehow contain iterated procrastination? What does that look like as a graph minor question? Well, here's again, repeated procrastination. Um, let's take away the costs and let's take away the directions on the edges. Although we could ask the question even with those built in, but I wanna ask a simple version of the question. Then we get this graph that I could call the K node theta. It's a K node path around the outside, these nodes here. And then there's one node in the center at the center of the thing. Okay, let's call that F sub K, the graph consisting of a K node path and one more node that all others linked. And the theorem that Seagal and I were able to prove is that yes, in fact, when the cost ratio is exponential, this structure must be present in the state space of the grid. This is the only way to get an exponential cost ratio. In other words, for every constant lambda greater than one, there's some epsilon greater than zero. So if the cost ratio exceeds lambda to the n, then the underlying directed graph of the instance must contain this f sub k minor, where k is very large, k is epsilon times n, right? A constant fraction of the entire graph is taken up with this iterated procrastination structure, this minor. And I want to give you a sketch of how we prove this theorem. Um, and uh, it'll just, just, just be a sketch. So I'll show you kind of some of the steps along the way. And as you, as, as you know, when you're trying to prove a theorem about containment of minors, you know, there is usually some part where you're sort of going along, taking what you know about the graph and using it to kind of stitch together the pieces of the minor. Right? I somehow have to produce these disjoint connected pieces of the graph and then show how they're all wired together to get the minor that I want. And I have relatively little to go on here. I mean, all I know is that the cost ratio is lambda to the n. So what can I do? Well, I can try to track the agent's progress as they attempt to make their way to the target, accumulating cost as they go. Okay. Um, so the agent uh, is traversing a path p as it tries to reach t. Here's a prefix of this path drawn here. Um, this number d of vw, from any node v to any other node w, I could look at the minimum cost of the edges on the short, on the minimum cost path from v to w, and I'll call that the weighted graph theoretic distance. The agent will probably not follow that because they're behaviorally biased, but I can at least define that number. Okay, as they go, their distance to the target is getting worse and worse. And so I can declare the rank of a node v to roughly be the log base b of its distance to the target. Uh, more precisely, it's the minimum j so that the distance to the target um, from v to t, right? I'm currently at v, I'm trying to get to t, and my weighted distance is bounded by b to the j times the true shortest path distance, the, the thing I wish I had taken a long time ago, d of s t. And it's the minimum j with that property. Now, a fact about the agent's behavioral bias, and this is a sense in which their bias is at a local level kind of mild, 
is that across one edge of P, um, one can show, and again, I'm the, the sub proofs of the claims here I'm, I'm going to omit for purposes of this talk, but you can show that the rank can increase by at most one. Because basically in any one step, the agent doesn't do anything that crazy. It, it, it misjudges cost by a factor of B, and that sort of adds one to this exponent. It only blows up by, by this factor of B. So I can actually track the path as the agent goes, right? The rank is potentially blowing up, but as it goes, it's blowing up in this sort of graded kind of way, this gradual way where it's increasing by most one. Um, but if the cost ratio really, really gets large, then there's some node on this path with a very large rank. Why is that? Well, because the agent ultimately incurs exponential cost relative to D of ST as the basic. And if they're incurring exponential cost over a traversal of at most n steps, then they're incurring exponential cost in one of those steps. And that one step is an edge that has just enormous cost. And that node must have exponential, must have very large rank. Where the rank is the log, so it's linear rank. For some epsilon, it's a rank. So the agent climbs in rank. It climbs from low down, rank zero, all the way up to rank epsilon. Now. And as it goes, it's uh, going up in a gradual way. It's only adding one every time. So as it does this, there's therefore a last, un until it first reaches epsilon n, there's some last time it's at rank j. Let's say vj is the last node right, on its ascent to rank epsilon n. Uh, let vj be the last node it encounters of rank j. Okay. And let's say qj, if it, at, at this point it could switch off its behavioral bias. You could just flip the off switch. We all wish we could do this. You flip the off switch on the behavioral bias, and now you're behaving optimally. Let qj be the shortest path, right? So if at this node, it could, um, the last node of rank zero, it could just bail out and take the true shortest path. It would take some path q0. Uh, from v1, if it could bail out and become optimal, it would take path q1 to t, and so forth. Now, note an interesting thing. Um, this Vj is the last node of rank j. So from there on, it's going to only see higher ranks. But on Qj, it's following a shortest path, so it's going to only see lower ranks, or ranks no greater. So these two paths must be disjoint, except for their intersection of Vj. So that's great. I have these Q0, Q1, Q2. They may intersect each other. That's fine. But each one will be disjoint from the suffix of the path, right? Q2 is disjoint from the suffix of the path continuing on from V2. So that gives me the minor that I want. Because what I have here is K equals epsilon n waypoints, these nodes Vj, each of which has a path down here that's disjoint from the spine. And as a result, I can declare these nodes to be the nodes on the fan. And I can contract all the union of all the QIs and node T into the super node that forms the fan line. Okay. And in that way, I've stitched together a K node fan. These, these nodes are the long path, and the union of all of these paths here is, the, uh, is that node in the center. Okay. So you can ask about sort of the tightness of this result. In fact, subsequent work by uh, a nice paper of Tong et al did a much more careful analysis and actually found sort of the tight trade-off. Right, so I had this lambda and this epsilon with no attempt to optimize relation of lambda and epsilon. But in fact, you can get, you can get a very, very tight trade-off between the size of the minor and the cost ratio. Okay, with the uh, three, four minutes that I have left, I wanted to uh, tell you, come back to one question and then I'll wrap up, which was choice reduction. There's a very interesting, if, if you're looking for an interesting open problem here, um, understanding how choice reduction works as a computational problem, I think is quite intriguing. I give you a graph, I'd like to delete nodes and make it traversable by the bias agent, much as I did here when I deleted that. So at first we thought this would be an easy problem, right? I give you the graph, I give you the reward and the costs. Um, can you delete nodes? We thought to ourselves, our initial idea was that if there's a traversable subgraph in G, then there should be a traversable subgraph that's a path. Just find the path that the agent would take, delete everything else away so only that path is left, and I'll take it. And that's not true, actually. It turns out there exist graphs that are traversable, but no path in that graph is traversable. Here's an example, and it's sort of a thought-provoking example. The reward is 12. I'm here. Um, I can traverse, and a biased agent will traverse this graph with b equals 2, because they'll look and they'll say, this is 2 times 2 uh, plus 6 plus 2 is 12. And therefore, if I think of this again as 12 plus epsilon, 
they'll traverse it, plan to take the upper path. They get to node A and something funny happens. This looks like two times six plus two is 14. This looks like two times three plus six is only 12. So it's still okay, but they switch and they go this way. Now, and, the, and they make it to the reward. Now, if I had deleted anything here, it wouldn't work because if I deleted node B, the agent would never start because this looks like four plus three plus six is 13. So they just wouldn't get the thing. And if I deleted C, they wouldn't continue when they got here. I need both of these uh, in order to finish, right? When, when, when we saw this, and it really kind of wasn't what we were expecting, but somehow the graph made it very plain, we asked ourselves, does this too correspond to some story that we recognize? Um, and we sort of argued it did. You know, it's sort of like, you know, if you're a child learning to play the violin, early on, you, you know, maybe you watch lots of YouTube videos online of virtuoso violin playing, and you're like, this looks amazing. I'm really excited about learning the violin. And so you do, you start learning it. And at some point you discover that actually to be one of those people in one of those YouTube videos is an enormous amount of work. It's much more work than you plan to actually spend on the violin. But by then you're actually playing the violin and you discover it's actually a very rewarding lifelong activity that you can do. And you end up taking this lower path at less upfront cost, right? So without the YouTube videos of these unrealistic scenarios, unrealistic for you scenarios, you would never start playing the violin. But without the ability to do it at this lower level of intensity, you would never have continued. And that's fundamentally what's going on in this picture. So in fact, the problem is harder than we thought. And it's actually NP complete to decide, is there a subgraph in, in, in the general worst case? But there are a number of things that I think are really quite wide open, including are there tractable subclasses of graphs on which you can solve this problem efficiently? And secondly, the approximation question. If I'm allowed to delete nodes and also maybe slightly inflate the reward, how little do I have to inflate the reward by to make this a tractable, solvable problem? All of these are quite open, I think, quite interesting to think about. So this is an overview of how we looked at what I think was a quite interesting area in, in the behavioral sciences, where a lot of nice mathematical models had been built. And we discovered that graphs were really a unifying language, allowing us to sort of turn these elaborate stories involving treasure maps and so forth into something we could really think about in indie graphs. And I think there are a lot of, a lot of nice open questions here, um, a lot of other directions that I haven't uh, been able to talk about, including the interaction of multiple biases that operate simultaneously. Present bias isn't the only thing we struggle with as human beings. And all of this, I think, comes back to the question of designing incentive systems, in the end, ideally to help people be more effective and to achieve the goals that they set for themselves. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so folks, if you have questions, feel free to unmute your microphone. So do they, does this apply, for example, in like how people market stuff? Yeah, so, right, so this is an interesting, yeah, so does it apply in marketing? Yeah, and this is actually an important thing to think about that, um, as with a lot of uh, sort of, you know, sort of conceptually flexible frameworks, this can be used for purposes that I think we would, you know, approve of or not approve of. Um, you know, and, and I think with, you know, with these kinds of models in the behavioral sciences, you have to ask, is the thing I'm describing, is it sort of helpful and enabling for people or is it exploitive? Um, my stories have all been relatively benign. I would like to help you become more fit and exercise. I'd like to help you finish this class. But you can imagine things where, for example, I exploit your present bias to keep leading you on with the promise of a payoff in the future, where potentially nothing I have done is deceptive, right? That's what's pernicious about this. I could always lie to you and say, pay this cost up front, and then something will happen. And you do, and I say, oh, sorry, I was lying. Hey, you hey, hear that are not lying. They're simply taking advantage of predictable features of your behavioral bias to cause you to sink a lot of effort into something I know you'll abandon. Um, yeah. And those, those get very bad. And so I think, you know, when we think about this from a, a design point of view, we should both ask, am I designing for sort of good or ill here? And I think that's an important question that, that we have to ask when we think about this. And secondly, I think once we recognize that potential, there's another uh, thing that can happen here, which is not just the design question, but almost the auditing question. I look at an incentive structure that's been set up and I ask, do I believe this was set up potentially to exploit someone's behavioral bias in a way that's gonna make it hard for them to finish? So I think all, all of these are all of these are important questions. Hmm. Uh, John, I'll, I'll ask if there is a uh, if there's a metric 
that captures this from the very beginning. I guess we can just calculate um, uh, the cost of a shortest path in, the, in this new uh, uh, in this new model from the very start. Yeah. What's the disadvantage of doing that? I guess we don't have all the information up front, perhaps. Yeah, I see. A metric to see: am I being exploitive or not? Um, yeah, I could. Right. So, if if the true shortest path is more than the reward, then the optimal agent will never start, and the biased agent only experiences larger costs, so they too will will never never start. So that, in this model anyway, would not would not be a source of danger. Right, so we would have to say, would an agent with the following pattern of bias end up spending costs without reaching the target? Right, has this been set up to cause them to incur costs and not reach the target, I guess, would be, I guess that, that would be one, one thing you could do to audit. The, like if the world were as simple as these directed graph structures, you would say, let me simulate the behavior of a biased agent on this graph and ask, do they either incur costs without reaching the reward, or does the cost they incur on the way of the reward exceed the reward that they get? Which can also happen, right? I can create a situation where you do make it to the target, but you end up paying more along the way than. John, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, must the reward be constant throughout this process? Uh, can Can you make uh, the reward actually time dependent? That's an interesting question. You could make the reward time dependent, and we've looked a little. A little bit at that, um, and that's an interesting, uh, an interesting extension of this. You can imagine both that the reward is shrinking. You can also imagine the reward is growing. For example, right, that I might be adding to it to kind of encourage you along. Um, and then you can ask questions about: Is the agent sort of aware of the schedule on the reward, or do they only see the present reward? You know, and again, those are questions about sort of what uh, behavioral economists call sophistication. Sort of, does the agent? Is the agent able to know about their bias in, in the planning of it? Um, and the changing of the reward also relates to something which uh, is sort of for another, you know, there's a whole other topic I could discuss. The, the idea of sunk cost bias is a different bias that involves planning about, about rewards, but it involve, typically involves reference to the past, not the future. It's the, it's the bias in which costs that we've already paid become in our minds like penalties if we give up, right? So you pay the, for the gym membership. At 6.30 a.m. the next week, you really don't feel like getting out of bed. Uh, but one thing that actually encourages you to get out of bed is the notion that you'll lose, you'll be throwing away the $20 you spent. And the funny thing is that too is irrational. It, it's an irrational way that even when people try to debunk it for you, you sort of don't believe it. That's how strong the bias is. But it's irrational in the sense that that $20 is gone. You getting up at 6.30 a.m. going to the gym does not bring the $20 back. You should at this point be asking yourself in a memoryless kind of way, if I had a free gym membership right now, would I be getting out of bed to go to the gym? Because that, that is the situation you're in. And yet people don't really reason that way. They reason, well, I want to justify the $20. And so there's a funny thing where these two biases sometimes actually, and we've been studying this in some recent work, <laughs> can partly cancel each other out. Because the present bias makes you not feel like doing it, the sunk cost bias kind of urges you on. And so in a way, it's almost like a sort of the reward structure is changing as you go. We got another question here. Um, Mark, go ahead and mute yourself. Yeah, so I was just wondering if you tried to calibrate the value of B. I mean, is it sort of penalty per time? And, um, you know, can you actually figure out what that is in real world settings? Yeah, so we've, we've started to try looking at this. And, and other people have looked at... Uh, have tried to look at some of these questions. So in, in the area of experimental behavioral economics, you'll do lab studies where you offer people a reward now, where they can wait. And, um, and it, is, it is sort of hard to calibrate, you know, especially because the world is never quite as clean as these models suggest. There's a lot of evidence that of course B is sort of varying over time, certainly varying over, over context. Um, and maybe, you know, most crucially it varies by, pe by person. Different people certainly have different innate levels of present bias. And so there's actually another interesting question. If, if I imagine some graph structure here, and I imagine many agents are going to be traversing it, and it's a complicated one, agents, and I imagine the agents differ in their value of B, different agents will take different paths, right? So I'm going to have a population that sort of fans out across the graph and actually does it in different ways based on their level of present bias. And so I have these sort of parametric shortest path problems, which are parameterized by this value. 
but but yeah, it uh, it's it it is challenging to try as many these parameters, but it, it is something that experimental behavior economists. Is. And does the time scale, like whether it's months or years or days, or does that affect the value of B significantly? That should matter, yeah, because even the question of what is the present time period is an interesting question. As in, costs I incur in the present are more salient, but is the present like the the stuff I'm holding in my head that I'm doing today? Is it like this instant? Yeah. So even the granularity of what counts as a step. And, and, and so in, in some sense, like actually framing effects can matter here, right? One way I can help people deal with their present bias is it, if I can get you to conceptually bundle a bunch of things together and say, you know, you must do all these things together so they become one thing, you often may, might reason about them differently than if you view them as a sequence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah those are all very interesting questions. Cool. Um, do we have any other questions? Folks? Joe, Joe, we have one question from Worcester. I've got one oh. for you. Just curious. Go right ahead. Uh, with using this B to multiply along the way in the cost, I know you're using, or I mean, it's a, it's a linear function in, in the cost. Is there any thought in using uh, other functions, like maybe squaring the cost as you go? The, the I see. Interesting. Step? Yeah. Um, that's a, it's a very natural, uh, a very natural question. And it, it is true in the literature on quasi hyperbolic discounting. Um, actually, people have looked at other functional forms, right? So the, in some sense, the, the history of discounting here is that the simplest version of discounting is just, you know, as I go, I multiply by this factor of delta less than one every time, uh, which is probably originally was a model of kind of the, you know, decreasing value of a fixed amount of cash over time, you know, there's inflation. Um, people began to discover that that wasn't what people were doing. And the original models actually used a hyperbolic function that t steps in the future, it looks like maybe constant over t um, instead of delta to the t. And so that was called hyperbolic discounting. Uh, that was very hard to work with. And so people said, well, what's, you know, what's the simplest approximation that just this time and consistent behavior? That would just be the present is different from all the other time periods. And so that became quasi hyperbolic discounting because uh, it was no longer the nice functional form of the hyperbola, but it was just the step function. So yeah, so there definitely is, and, and you can combine these things. I could have sort of combinations of these terms. Uh, so I think, you know, the, f the factor of B is nice because we can see a lot of interesting qualitative behavior and reason about it structurally without having to look at these sort of more elaborate functional forms. But, it certainly seems believable that if I were, if we were going to sort of go deeper into what's what's actually happening here, we would want to think about these richer functional forms. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, are there further questions? How are folks doing? Otherwise, you're welcome to unmute. Let's thank John very much. Really appreciated this talk. Thank you. Um, and we hope to see folks again sometime soon. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks for inviting